All right, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm really happy today to be presenting uh, part two of this climate training with RSET. Uh, this is a, uh, a presentation focused on climate change, future scenarios, impact forecasting, and adaptation. Uh, my name is Alex Ruane. I am a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And uh, I put this together along with uh, colleagues, uh, especially Dan Bader at NASA GISS. Um, so let's jump in. So as I mentioned, this is part two of a two-part climate training uh, by RSET. Uh, part one focused on climate change monitoring and impacts using remote sensing and model data. Uh, and uh, that was recorded uh, and presented on September 29th. Um, and this uh, presentation uh, will be given twice today. Uh, October 6th, and uh, and there will be follow-up uh, in uh, in the weeks ahead. So in particular, uh, if if you are looking for a certificate of completion in terms of taking this RSET training, uh, there is one homework assignment. Answers must be submitted via a Google form uh, accessed via the RSET website. Uh, this homework is now available, and the due date is two weeks from today, October 20th. Uh, and if that is completed uh, to the satisfaction, then there will be a certificate of completion uh, awarded to those who attend the live webinars, complete the homework assignment by the deadline, and, uh, and then that certificate would come approximately two months after the completion of the course. The goals for this RSET training uh, really are oriented around how we can make climate information useful. Uh, that means we have to begin with the basics of climate information to, to make sure that those providing and, and using climate information understand the core processes uh, involved. Uh, the use of climate models and how we can use them to project and understand the climate system. Historical versus future climate conditions. And approaches that we use to assess climate impacts. This helps us design climate adaptations. Uh, and in that sense, uh, make use of this climate information. Uh, okay, so let's jump in and begin with the climate change basics. Uh, I'm gonna try to be very light in this presentation in terms of equations um, and, and, and technical details. Uh, so here I'm gonna give just a very brief introduction in terms of the core radiative basis of climate change. Um, the first uh, fundamental process that, that is important to understand is that uh, objects with warmer temperature uh, radiate away more energy. So warmer temperatures means more energy is radiated away. Uh, so consider just a, a simple setup here where we have the moon and the earth and the sun off far in the distance. This is not to scale, of course. Uh, what's important to note is that the moon has virtually no atmosphere. So the, in, in this situation, we have energy coming in from the sun and it reaches uh, these objects, and uh, these objects are going to have an energy balance, which means the amount of energy coming in has to be balanced by the amount of energy coming out. Uh, and the amount of energy going out is determined by that temperature. So at this balance of energy, we have a temperature. Now, of course, the Earth is not like the moon in the sense that we do have an atmosphere. So when we add an atmosphere to this equation, or when we thicken the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, uh, the same amount of sunlight is coming in, uh, but some of the outgoing energy is trapped and, and directed back down towards the planet. This means in this situation, there's more energy coming in than the energy going out, which means the planet has to warm at the surface to get back into balance. Uh, that means we can reachieve this energy in equals energy out, this, this climate equilibrium, but to do so, it has to be warmer. So overall, this greenhouse gas effect is the atmosphere trapping some of this energy uh, and forcing this adjustment towards warmer temperatures. The current climate research and our efforts on applications are trying to take this fundamental radiative basis of climate change uh, and extend them uh, to understand what happens to that extra energy. Where does that energy go in, in terms of within the atmosphere? within the oceans, within ice, land surface, and vegetation, all of these components of the climate system uh, could potentially take some energy. That energy changes the way that the climate behaves uh, in terms of shifting atmospheric patterns, uh, in terms of temperature and rainfall, for example, and winds. Uh, it changes the way we have extreme events. It changes the levels of the sea 
Uh, and there are several feedback loops in terms of complex uh, responses to these energy changes that can in turn increase or decrease the overall rate of energy exchange. This changing climate in turn affects nature and society and things that we care about. Uh, of course, this begins with ecosystems and species, but also many human systems like agriculture, water resources, infrastructure, health, forests, fisheries, and transportation, and many more. Of course, the other big area of research and applications right now is understanding how our actions shape the future. Uh, that means we need to understand how the choices we make in terms of emissions, adaptation, and risk management will change the, the type of climate that we have in the future and our ability to be resilient to climate changes uh, and, and respond to the climate as it shifts with us. Uh, it's important to, to take one step back here and think about the application that we're, we're addressing uh, and make sure that we're picking our models and data sets for the purpose of our application. And in that sense, it's worth going back to a, another fundamental, which is reminding ourselves that weather and climate have fundamental differences. What you see on the screen right now uh, is a, a snapshot from Tuesday, September 21st, so just a couple of weeks back, um, where this is the two meters, so the surface temperature, uh, and we're looking at the difference between that day in 2021 and the average from a period at the end of the 20th century, from 1979 to 2000. Uh, and in that sense, where you see oranges on the screen are places that were warmer than the average September 21st, and where you see blue are places that are cooler than the average September 21st in that 20-year period. And what you'll notice on this map is that there are lots of interesting features and regional patterns, uh, small scale, large scale, uh, and, and a bunch of, of things to look at. A lot of this you might classify as the weather of that day, but there are also broader patterns to look at. Uh, one might squint their eyes and, and try to get an idea of what the global anomaly looks like, and you might see that there's a little bit more orange than blue, but you don't have to take our word for it. In the bottom left, you'll see that the world anomaly is 0.2 degrees Celsius warmer than that end of century period. Uh, that would be a climatological feature in terms of understanding that, that longer term, that statistical uh, characteristic of the climate system um, and understanding how that is evolving over the longer term. Um, but it is worth noting that these weather patterns are often what people experience. Uh, and the, the statistical representation of weather patterns and the events and, and averages and extremes that are within that uh, tell us about the climate system uh, and, and how we can go forward. Now, it's also important to recognize, especially in this northern hemisphere fall season uh, and southern hemisphere spring season, that there are many transitions. And it's often difficult, I have found, for people to remember what September 21st should feel like. Uh, it's, it's difficult for us to, to know if today is a really hot day or a cool day, or maybe just an average day in these transitional seasons. So I personally enjoy this uh, Climate re Reanalyzer website where I got this map, uh, because it gives us an idea. For example, I'm sitting in New York, and this was a fairly typical September 21st day, even as our neighbors uh, north in, in Canada were having a quite warm September 21st. Of course, uh, when we look at these longer term climate trends, uh, we see patterns uh, that, sh that show the climate change that we're here to discuss today. Uh, on the screen now is the uh, NASA GIS surface temperature analysis, uh, which has been calculating uh, anomalies of, of surface temperature at meteorological stations all around the world. On the left, you see the time series increasing uh, as we uh, come towards present. And here is just August 2021, uh, showing that there have been warmer conditions uh, across uh, much of the world compared to uh, the, the 1951 to 1980 period. Um, this, uh, this product is updated around the middle of each month and is where you might see stories about, uh, you know, the warmest August on record or the, you know, where does 2020 rank among recent years in terms of global temperatures. It's also really important to note that there has been a major international effort uh, to assess the field of climate science. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, uh, was uh, commissioned by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to assess 
the state of the science around climate change. Um, and they recently released their uh, sixth assessment report uh, from uh, a working group focused on the fundamental climate science. Uh, this report came out in August of 2021. And one of the primary conclusions here is that climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. The changes that we're experiencing are also uh, projected to experience or to increase with further warming. Um, that is uh, a, a, a really strong indication that uh, climate change is something that we have to grapple with, uh, but also something that human activities have the potential to slow down or even stabilize. All right, now shifting over to climate simulations and the way that we use models uh, to understand the climate system. So NASA has many products to monitor and simulate climate, and you would have seen this uh, in the other RSET trainings, including part one of this training, uh, which I've already mentioned. Uh, just to give a couple examples uh, to, to make sure we're covering all of the bases here, um, NASA has key products relating to uh, precipitation, such as iMERGE. Uh, MODIS products get us lots of information around temperature and vegetation. Uh, we have products on soil moisture, like SMAP, uh, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory tells us about carbon uh, fluxes and exchanges and pools. And, uh, and then, of course, we, we would look to uh, things like the National Snow and Ice Data Center to understand sea ice and other elements of the cryosphere. This is just a very small sample of a much larger set of, uh, of cutting edge remote sensing and observational products uh, that help us understand uh, the, the climate system and observe its changes uh, over time. Uh, of course, NASA is also taking these data and building physical models that help us to uh, connect these observations uh, and fill in gaps between these observations. So we uh, wanted to exp expressly call out uh, the NASA Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications, now MERA-2. Um, and, the NIS, uh, and the NASA GISS Model E, which I will talk about more in a moment. Uh, this is one of the premier NASA Earth system models. Uh, there is also a, uh, a set of global daily downscale projections produced by the NASA Earth Exchange, uh, which we will discuss later as well. These are just some to call out among a larger set. When we're talking about these models and these observational products, what we are doing is we're trying to cover and understand different components of the climate system uh, and the drivers that might cause changes in this climate system. So what you see on the screen is a, uh, a, a simple cartoon showing some of the major features of the climate system. Uh, of course, uh, you might immediately think of the atmosphere, uh, the chemical composition of the atmosphere, clouds, sunlight, uh, the temperatures and rainfall that, that you might get within that uh, atmosphere. Of course, the climate system also interacts with the oceans, uh, the vegetation and biosphere, the ice and snow cryosphere elements of the climate system, and of course, land and surface hydrology. All of these are parts of a larger climate system. Uh, and what you see on the screen also are some of the things that can drive changes in that climate system. For example, there may be changes in the sun. There may be changes in the way that our industry uh, puts out greenhouse gases or, or agriculture or, or deforestation, for example, uh, all can do this. There are also other drivers like volcanoes that can change aerosols and other components of, of the atmospheric chemistry uh, to, to have strong interactions. So we are building our models to try to understand this system uh, and the way it will respond to these types of driving changes. The way we do this, uh, one of the primary ways at least, is to build climate models. Uh, and as I mentioned before, one of the premier NASA models is the NASA GIS Model E. Um, climate models build, uh, or climate models are built on fundamental principles of physics and chemistry. Uh, they represent the climate system in all of its elements through grids and fundamental equations that, that are three-dimensional um, around the world, up into the atmosphere, down into the oceans, and representing major components of, of ice and land and biosphere. Um, these fundamental equations seek to balance across uh, key budgets like water and energy to make sure that we're conserving uh, mass and energy in the system. 
they are also driven strongly by initial conditions and the boundary forcings uh, and other drivers, things like sunlight or land use or greenhouse gas emissions that can change uh, the system in terms of the, the energy coming in or the chemistry uh, of the atmosphere. Uh, we also tune these climate models using surface stations and remote sensing data sets using advanced machine learning processes, which allow us to use our remote sensing observations to build better models. Um, we also independently validate these models against observed trends and variability um, and look to these models in particular to extend beyond those things that we can directly observe. Um, that means filling in spatial and temporal gaps, but also going uh, to conditions that are hypothetical pathways of, of society and, and, uh, and other uh, changes that, that could come with climate change. Of course, models themselves are, are subject to limits in predictability, uh, especially uh, models uh, of the atmosphere, given the chaotic nature of the climate system. Uh, that means that we are, are limited by the spatial resolution, and even some of the fundamental physics uh, limit our ability to make accurate predictions and to actually observe and capture every process. Of course, to do something on this scale requires computational systems uh, that are some of the most powerful in the entire world. Um, the NASA Discover supercomputer that you see on the screen uh, is one of, of uh, several supercomputing centers uh, that are running atmospheric and other climate models. Um, and this technology enables better and better models uh, over time and allows us to ask more interesting and useful questions. As I mentioned over time, with the computational power and advances in climate science, we have been able to increase our resolution and our ability to represent specific processes within the model. So here is just a demonstration of some of the typical climate and atmospheric models that you may have seen uh, over the decades. So back in 1990, it was typical to find individual grid cells on the order of 500 kilometers. Uh, and uh, what you see on the screen is the elevation of, uh, of Europe. And you can see that it was a coarse representation back in 1990. Uh, as we go forward in time, you'll see these resolutions increasing and starting to actually pull out features that we would recognize as the Alps or the Atlas Mountains or Greenland's ice sheets, uh, not to mention some of the internal coastlines. So this type of improvement uh, has gotten us uh, far. And of course, there is always more to go. Um, and these can be even further extended using regional climate models uh, and empirical models that, that uh, use statistical approaches to get to finer resolution. So here, for example, is uh, the type of representation you might have in a regional model at 30 kilometer resolution, where now you are seeing some of the sub mountain ranges across Europe. Uh, and these things matter when it comes to circulations and extreme events uh, and other energy exchanges. Uh, as an overview of this, climate models have advanced since 1990. Uh, the typical model resolution has gone from 500 kilometers back in the first IPCC assessment to now the models that we use in the IPCC sixth assessment tend to be around an order of 100 kilometer resolution with regional models getting down to 25 to 50 kilometer resolution. The components of the climate system that we include have extended uh, from atmosphere, ocean, radiation, and land physics and sea ice to now adding additional things like detailed atmospheric chemistry, shifts in land use and land cover, uh, land and ocean biogeochemistry, and improved interactions uh, between aerosols and clouds. Uh, in general, it's important to go back and, and recognize what climate models were designed to do. Uh, they were designed to understand the climate response to combined or individual driving factors. Uh, such as uh, understanding how methane is a different greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, we also, of course, look to climate models to understand the impacts of policy choices, uh, like large-scale greenhouse gas emissions policy, um, but other things like air quality, for example, I'll show in a moment. Uh, we also can use climate models to get an idea of the types of climate changes that are coming uh, as a forewarning of a need for adaptation. And this can be done in conjunction with local vulnerability assessments. And as we'll show in the, the second part of this uh, presentation, 
the climate models begin the conversation, uh, but further information is needed uh, before action can be taken. They're also quite good at understanding the potential impact of known unknowns, or things that we know are important but cannot specifically predict. Uh, for example, in the historical record, we have seen large volcanic eruptions that can have major influences on the climate, such as Pinatubo. Uh, and we know that these things are likely to happen again in the future, even if we cannot predict them at present. Uh, we can run them as potential hypothetical scenarios. It's also important to recognize what climate models are not particularly designed for. Um, climate models are not what you would use to make perfect short or long-term predictions. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a chaotic nature of internal variability uh, and imperfections in the models and data. Not to mention, if we're making a long-term pred prediction, we have to also understand uncertainty in things like the economics behind greenhouse gas emissions and land use change. Um, this is another example. If you wanted to know what the, the forecast would be for this weekend, you would look for a weather model rather than a climate model, uh, as it would be focused on those types of smaller scale um, interactions and dynamics. Um, climate models are also not able to solve political issues or ethical quandaries. There is no calculation on ethics in any subroutine, for example. Um, so we rely on scenarios to understand the ramifications of different political or ethical choices. We also do not look to climate models to understand truly local information given those scale issues. Uh, models tend to be evaluated primarily at larger scales, even beyond those specific grid, grid point levels. Um, and the, the information below 100 kilometer is, is not necessarily going to be reliable uh, in, in the near term uh, because we are representing some processes there, but there is a lot more calibration and validation to be done. Climate models are also not particularly uh, capable of understanding what we would call unknown unknowns. For example, models that were run in 1970 did not know about ozone chemistry and therefore did not know about the stratospheric ozone hole. Um, there is, uh, of course, the potential for similar uh, unknown unknowns uh, to emerge and, uh, and, and recognizing that potential shortcoming is important as we manage risk in the future. In terms of climate simulations, of course, we use our climate models to understand historical and future climate. One of the most important things to do is to determine the human influence on the climate system. So what you see on the left is a figure from the, the recent IPCC, um, Working Group 1 Summary for Policymakers. And in, in the green cloud uh, with the green line, you'll see simulations using climate models where only natural forcings were included, such as volcanoes, solar cycles, and changes in the axis and orbits of, of the Earth. This produced a fairly stable climate with wiggles, but generally keeping uh, global temperatures around uh, the, the historical uh, conditions. Um, when we look at the actual observations in black, we see that there has been a divergence from this green cloud. And to represent that green, that, that observed trend, we have to include human factors, such as the greenhouse gas emissions, aerosol emissions, and land use change. When we do factor those human influences in, along with the natural variability, we end up having a much better representation of the climate changes that we have observed since pre-industrial conditions. This knowledge that humans are influencing the climate system uh, also motivates looking forward into the future. And one of the fundamental ways to understand this uh, future projection is by the overall amount of carbon dioxide emissions. The overall amount of greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere will in many ways determine how far climate change will occur. Um, in this graph here, also from the IPCC, you can see the historical conditions up until the early 21st century, and then several scenarios going out into the future. Uh, these are a, uh, a set of scenarios, sometimes called SSP, RCP scenarios, meaning shared socioeconomic pathways representing socioeconomic development, things like income or technology or land use or governance, uh, independent of climate change, whereas the RCP component, which is the second number here, 
uh, 1.9, 2.6, et cetera, rep is, is what we call representative concentration pathway, which talks about the, the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere and, and the, their evolution over time. And this set of pathways also includes information around uh, greenhouse gas emissions, aerosols, and carbon fluxes from natural sources. Um, as you can see, these SSP RCP scenarios uh, extend further out towards the right here, meaning more and more CO2 emissions um, as we, we uh, get out to, towards this SSP 585 uh, scenario. With that increase in carbon emissions, we also see uh, corresponding increases in the global warming levels. Uh, and, and the question for policymakers is how far will we go in terms of burning greenhouse gas emissions? We can take those same scenarios and run them out into the, the future, uh, out to the end of the 20, uh, out to the year 2100, and look at the global warming, uh, the global temperatures that, that follow. And what you see in this chart are the various SSP RCP combinations. And the, the, the solid line here in the middle represents the uh, ensemble uh, mean. And you have a spread from the climate models representing some uncertainty within each of those climate models. Um, in this case, we're drawing from a large set of climate models that are organized by the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP, uh, which has about 50 modeling centers and around 100 distinct models that have uh, produced some level of output. Um, but what's important to note here is that the spread across the climate models is still smaller than the spread between the pathways, uh, whether we have a high mitigation and therefore low greenhouse gas emission scenario, uh, or whether we have a low mitigation scenario uh, with higher greenhouse gases. The uncertainty across the climate models is less than the uncertainty of which pathway society will take. Another way of representing this has, has uh, picked up a lot of uh, attention, which is these uh, global warming stripes. Uh, and this is a way of representing the historical uh, and future projections of temperature on a global level with each year represented as a vertical stripe uh, with the color of the global temperature. And what you see here is from pre-industrial conditions towards today, we have this dramatic increase in terms of the amount of pink and red years, suggesting that the, or showing that the global uh, warming levels have, have increased. Um, we get out to this mark here where it says today, and we face five, representative pathways that we can choose to go down uh, depending on, on actions that society might take. In this very low emissions future, um, we would be facing this type of set, you know, this, this set of red stripes, uh, suggesting that it will be warmer than, than the past. Uh, but this is still in stark contrast to a middle or a high emission scenario uh, where you end up much deeper into these dark reds showing much warmer global temperatures. So this amount of pathway dependence, and within them, the spread across here is uh, different climate models in terms of how deep and how early those, those reds might appear. Um, this gives us an idea of the choices uh, that society is facing. If we take a spatial approach and look at this, we'll see that the climate projections can be done using these scenarios uh, and then determining which time we're looking at. So in this case, we're looking at a mid-century 2041 to 2060 period under a, uh, a moderately high emissions SSP 3-7.0 uh, scenario. And you can see that in this mid-century period, we have a pattern of warming. Uh, that is accentuated and deepened when we go to the end of the century. Uh, some of these patterns are, are quite strong uh, and, and scale generally with the global warming levels. Another way of looking at this is by looking at specific levels of global temperature. In this case, this is the, uh, the map when the global warming level reaches 1.5 degrees, uh, and the bottom row is when it reaches 3 degrees Celsius. And you can see temperature on the left and precipitation on the right. Again, these charts coming from IPCC. And you'll notice again, some of the patterns are consistent across different global warming levels. 
Um, and these patterns are fairly robust, uh, regardless of which uh, scenario, which pathway we take to get there. Um, so these are the, the worlds that we are, are choosing between. Uh, it's also, of course, important to recognize that climate change does not stop at the year 2100, just because some of these charts do. And uh, the, the chart you'll see on the screen at the bottom now is the global mean sea level, and it's the change relative to the year 1900. And in this case, the chart has gone out to, the, to uh, 2100 and shows a, a fairly tight spread. But if we were to extend this out to the year 2300, you can see that the spread becomes much more dramatic. Uh, even this, this uh, high mitigation scenario uh, that, that is, uh, uh, involves substantial uh, effort to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, has, has large global sea levels uh, that, that will uh, likely spur risk and, and actions along coastlines. Um, the high emissions scenario goes much further and even extends off the chart here where the IPCC could not rule out uh, sea levels greater than 15 meters, for example, by the year 2300. This is because some components of the Earth system, especially ice and deep oceans, take a long time to respond to global warming. Um, and in that sense, until the Earth climate system comes to an equilibrium, you could see continuing changes in these factors. Another way of representing this is by looking at the spread of climate projections owing to different sources of uncertainty. Um, what we refer to here as internal variability are things like weather uh, and other chaotic patterns within the, within the climate system um, that tend to go up and down uh, on an on a internal mode. Um, and you can see that in the early years, this type of uncertainty dominates. And that's another way of us saying that in the, the first decades beyond present, uh, what will happen is largely dependent on these internal fluctuations in the, in the climate system. However, as we go further on to the future, those fluctuations don't really get any bigger, while things like uncertainty in the models start to become more important, this blue level. Um, and then as we get further and further out into the future, as we mentioned earlier, the spread between the scenarios, the actual uh, pathways that we choose become the dominant source of uncertainty. A fundamental principle that's important to know uh, is that each climate model has a slightly different response to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is the, the sum of many internal dynamics and, and, uh, and process representations. Uh, but we refer to this as the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is the equilibrium or steady state change in the surface temperature following a doubling of the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations from pre-industrial conditions, which is another way of saying that if we have a, a fundamental doubling of this important greenhouse gas, what is the climate response? Um, we can look across different climate models and see some have high equilibrium climate sensitivity, which means they warm up very quickly with greenhouse gases, and others have a lower equilibrium climate sensitivity, um, which means they have a, a slower response to that greenhouse gas. Um, but overall, we see a distribution which suggests that there is a likely range and some low likelihood higher and lower models. And this uncertainty is important to recognize as we go out into the future. Uh, it's also very important to note that climate models are useful beyond these core uh, greenhouse gas sets of simulations. For example, we use climate models to look at the, the potential for low likelihood high impact events like a major volcano or a shift in some ocean circulation pattern. We also can use them to look at air quality and energy policy. Uh, for example, in this example um, uh, simulation, there was a policy for widespread electric vehicle adoption, uh, which caused greenhouse gases to come not out of, uh, or sorry, aerosols to come not out of tailpipes, but from uh, localized power plants. And this changes the type of aerosol uh, that you might get from burning at power plants compared to in a car's engine. Uh, and led to a shift in the overall aerosols concentration around the world, uh, re resulting in changed uh, atmospheric forcing across the, the world with patterns that we can simulate here. 
Um, so this ability to understand the ramifications of a policy uh, in terms of air quality and overall climate impacts uh, is important even on the short term. Another set of applications for climate models is to go back and look at ancient climates, uh, what we would call paleoclimate, which is the simulation of things like ice ages or mega droughts uh, that were, uh, were many decades or centuries or millennia ago. Um, there is also very exciting uh, new applications around understanding the climates of distant planets. Uh, here, looking at exoplanets orbiting uh, distant stars. And here is a simulation of a planet called Proxima Centauri b. Uh, and this is a planet that is tidally locked to its star, which means it does not rotate uh, the way that we would think about it on Earth. The sun is always hitting one point on the planet. And here we've just uh, imposed the Earth's uh, geographical uh, pattern, uh, but you can see the effect of having two different places where the sun hits, whether it were to hit uh, on the, uh, the longitude equivalent of Central Europe versus a longitude equivalent of the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You have different patterns in terms of how that energy is spread across the planet and different patterns of what the temperature might look like. Uh, and this is important not only to understand these fascinating places, but as we think about what life might look like and where it might fit and sit on planets such as this. In terms of using climate information to go to impact and risk sectors, um, we want to begin by looking at how we think about risk. In general, we are in uh, this presentation here focused on climate information coming from natural sources and coming from human influences. This climate information tells us about climate hazards, but hazards are one component of risk that must be combined with vulnerability and exposure. Um, this intersection of a climate hazard with a vulnerable system that is exposed to that climate hazard uh, creates what we think of as risk, and this is where you would expect to find impacts. Um, this is something that is in turn affected by socioeconomic processes. So for example, if the hazard we're interested in is drought, the extent to which a farm is vulnerable to that drought may have something to do with the way it has been designed and invested upon uh, with the, the uh, background of economic and market situation. Um, and then whether that farm and the overall breadbasket is in a place that is exposed to drought gives us some semblance of the overall risk. And of course, these things can be modified by adaptation or mitigation actions, uh, and governance can be uh, uh, something that sets enabling conditions. Um, it's also important in, in recent work, uh, there has been an emphasis that responses to climate change, such as adaptation or mitigation, can in turn also affect risk. Um, so it, that is something to, to understand. We, of course, are interested in climate risk and impacts across many different sectors. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly go through some of them. Here is an example for terrestrial ecosystems, where, for example, we are currently monitoring fires across uh, much of the Western United States. We also use climate information to understand risks to marine ecosystems, uh, such as the mangroves in Belize pictured here. We look at uh, climate information related to water resources applications so that we can understand, for example, why Lake Mead levels in August 2000 were so different than they are in August 2021. We also use climate information to look at food systems, uh, both in terms of the way they interact with forests and, and uh, deforestation, uh, but also to understand how the management and, and use of uh, farm equipment affects uh, the climate system, uh, but also how that management produces healthy crops uh, and supplies markets and in turn feeds uh, healthy and, and uh, growing populations. We also look at climate information in urban areas. Uh, here is an example of uh, a subway stop within New York City showing the, uh, the after effects of Hurricane Sandy, which came and flooded uh, this station. Uh, leaving debris even up on top of these signs. Uh, this type of information helps in, in many aspects of urban planning and resilience building. We can also look specifically at human health uh, and climate effects uh, on, on human uh, populations. In particular here, we're looking at a map on the right 
um, that is looking at heat vulnerable neighborhoods uh, represented in, in blue and the red areas which are hot spots of heat uh, within New York City. Uh, of course, where you have hot spots of heat and large local vulnerability is where you might expect the largest risk. Uh, it's also important to recognize that climate is a uh, background condition for a lot of uh, development and many people's livelihoods are very closely tied to climate systems, uh, such as this uh, population in informal settlements in Dhaka of Bangladesh. When we look to make impacts and risk projection, uh, we try to follow a framework uh, that produces solid results for climate action. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do uh, would be to represent the current system of interest. And as I'll show in the, in the future slides, uh, we will follow each of these steps. Uh, the second thing will be to represent current climate, then look at how the system changes in the future so that when we project our future climate, we are attaching those climate conditions to the system of the future. Um, we then project future climate impacts so that we can identify and test adaptation and risk management strategies. This fundamental framework, uh, we will now uh, describe in a little bit more detail. So the first thing to do would be to represent the current sectoral system. Here is an example of a farm system. Uh, and you might have a, a farming family uh, with their own details in terms of gender and demography and, and uh, income. Uh, and connections to, to uh, society and markets, et cetera. Um, but they may be growing a certain crop with certain uh, nitrogen inputs and access to water or energy or uh, farm equipment. Um, understanding the specific elements of a system, the conditions and the lifetimes of the, of the system components, uh, the, the ability of that uh, actor, in this case, the farmers, um, and their motivations and the boundaries of the system. For example, where, where do they take their crops and, and what type of market influence might, uh, might adjust the way they, they uh, run their systems. All of this helps us better understand what is being impacted uh, if climate change affects this, this location. Um, of course, we also have to represent the current climate of that system. And as we've seen before, there are many ways we can do that. Uh, in terms of various NASA products. But the goal here is to characterize the current climate conditions that that farm system uh, or similar thing would be exposed to today. We then look to understand that climate system, not just on the most prominent types of climate information, but we would look to inventory the different types of climate responses that might be important. And here we'll introduce this concept of climatic impact drivers. Uh, which are climate conditions that directly affect elements of society or ecosystems. And it's important to note that these climatic impact drivers, or CIDs, uh, they can have positive, negative, or inconsequential outcomes depending on the region and the system that is affected. And here is an inventory of the types of climate changes that you might want to look at to understand how your system may be vulnerable. And you can see this includes things related to temperature, like uh, average temperatures and extreme heat, and of course, things like precipitation and floods and droughts, and extends further into snow and coastal and ocean effects as well. One of the important things is to recognize that systems often respond uh, at given thresholds um, that are particularly uh, related to the tolerance of a system, whether it's a biophysical tolerance or an engineered tolerance. And here you are looking at a chart showing uh, a particular heat threshold, which is coming from NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, the NOAA heat index uh, is a combination of temperature and humidity. And when that index exceeds 41 degrees Celsius, it is considered dangerous. Um, this condition, as you can see, has a very different distribution in terms of the number of days per year that you would be in this dangerous condition. Uh, if, if you look uh, in, in your own part of the world, you might see that it is strongly dependent on which of these scenarios we follow and whether we're looking in the mid-century or end of century. Uh, in this case, at the end of the century, under a high emission scenario, there are many parts of the world uh, that are routinely exceeding this dangerous condition. And this is important, of course, for 
human health, especially those who are looking to do outdoor exercise or construction or agricultural labor. When we're looking at future climate, it's important to look at the intensity of climate changes as well as the frequency of extreme events, the extreme event duration, the seasonal timing at which events may occur, and the spatial extent in terms of whether, whether uh, you will see extremes in parts of the world that have never seen them before. Um, this relationship to tolerance threshold is important. And what you see on the right here is the projected number of hot days. In this case, we're using a, a Fahrenheit scale. Uh, but when the maximum temperature ex exceeds 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you can see that in the, in the baseline, in the historical period, it only happened 18 days a year. Uh, but under upcoming decades, you start to see this event occurring uh, more than 25 days per year nearly 50 days per year uh, and up to 76 days per year, even in the central estimates going on to the 2080s in this New York City example. We can also represent climate extremes uh, in terms of uh, particular extreme events like a 10-year heavy precipitation event. Uh, in this case, we're looking at an event that is expected to occur once every 10 years on average. Um, and in the, in the pre-industrial conditions before human society had dramatic influences on the climate system, um, this would have happened only once every 10 years. But as we go into warmer and warmer global temperature conditions, up to a four degrees global warming level, this event would happen almost three times every 10 years. Um, another way of looking at this would be to understand what would be the new 10-year event um, under each of these conditions. And in that same four degree global warming level, the new event that would happen once every 10 years would be 30% wetter than the current condition that happens once every 10 years. So in this sense, we understand both the frequency of an extreme event happening more often and also the intensity of that extreme event um, should it occur uh, at the same regularity. We also want to emphasize that uh, sometimes it's easier to have strong and robust statistics over broader regions, such as this graph from the US National Climate Assessment showing changes uh, in extreme precipitation under a low and high emission scenario. Uh, here it's assessed on broader multi-state regions. Um, that is very useful to draw out large patterns. Um, but it's important to recognize that oftentimes adaptation responses and actions are taken locally. Um, so there's a trade-off in terms of some of these scale decisions. Uh, another way of looking at this would be to remember that we have many climate models. And in this case, we're looking at core changes in temperature and precipitation for a county in Alabama. This is Henry County. And what you see with this black square is the historical condition. And there is a green cloud representing near-term projections showing warmer conditions, um, but a spread in precipitation. And then as you go to the yellow cloud and brown cloud representing mid-century and the red cloud representing end of century, you can see that there is strong agreement in warming, um, but not strong agreement in terms of the precipitation. Some models are wetter than present day. Some models are drier than present day. And you could even distinguish between circles and triangles in terms of which scenario uh, in terms of emissions. But some of these larger patterns are important to recognize as well as the uncertainty. Another thing that we do with our observations and our climate models is we combine uh, our best understanding of present day climate with our projections of climate changes to produce what we will call bias adjusted climate projections. Um, these use uh, the models and the observations to compare in the historical period and determine what are those climate model biases. Um, could be things like the intensity, frequency, or uh, the distribution of, of extreme events, or the finer spatial patterns lower than the grid scale of the climate model. Um, we can then adjust the climate model projections to counteract these biases. Uh, to impose stronger, uh, uh, more, more uh, observationally consistent patterns in those coarse global models. The benefit, of course, is that this reduces many of the biases that are important to sector responses. Um, however, there are also drawbacks 
for example, assuming that the historical biases are the same as those you would find in the future. Um, it also depends on having strong observational data to determine those biases and therefore is limited in areas with poor observational coverage. Uh, whenever we do a bias adjustment, it's important to note that statistics are used to make these adjustments and only statistics that are within focus are going to be affected. However, others may not be. So it's important to know the methods that are used um, because especially they can lead in their adjustments to temporal, spatial, or internal consistencies, uh, inconsistencies in those adjusted data sets. Here's just an example. Uh, the NASA NEXT high resolution climate projections uh, are already out for CMIP 5, and there are CMIP 6 projections coming soon. Uh, but even in CMIP 5, there were projections for temperature and, and precipitation using four different methodological approaches, 30 different models across the major scenarios with global coverage at about 25 kilometer resolution and continental US coverage down even to 800 meter resolution on a monthly scale and six kilometers on a daily scale. When we go to that future, it's important to recognize that there are changes in the future system. So if we revisit our, our farming family, it's important to recognize that by the time we get to mid-century, this farm may have invested in livestock or may have new vegetable gardens or intercropping or something that makes that system different than what we have today. That future system may therefore respond differently uh, to what we have today. This approach to understand how climate will affect future systems is one of the motivations for using additional impact models such as crop models to understand climate impacts on future systems. Uh, here is an example of a, uh, an upcoming study uh, by Jonas Jägermeier and colleagues that was done as part of the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project and the Intersectoral Impacts Model Improvement uh, Intercomparison Project, that's AGMIP and EZMIP. Um, their projections of corn or maize production at the end of the century uh, under a high emission scenario show, uh, show yield losses across much of the world. Uh, but also pockets of, of regions where there could be yield increases uh, due to local management and local climate conditions. Um, these types of impact projections are important to, uh, to examine uh, using current and future systems to understand how those are also changing. Um, and this type of information becomes important because of international trade and large scale changes uh, in terms of the way that food and other commodities flow around the world. Uh, create interest on a local level all the way up to the global level. Uh, it's also important to recognize that projections become increasingly uncertain as you move further into the impacts realm. Uh, here's an example of a project that was done, uh, again, with the AGMIP group, um, looking at wheat and cotton yields in Pakistan. And in this situation, we had temperature projections that you can see uh, become more uncertain as you go into the future in a high emissions and moderate emissions scenario. Uh, the, precip the precipitation projections were also quite uncertain across the whole century. This led to uh, projections of bread, wheat, and cotton yield declines. But this spread here now includes the spread from multiple climate models and multiple crop models under both of these emissions pathways. Uh, representing that uncertainty is critical as we're making our adaptation and risk plans uh, to recognize what we what we have confidence in uh, and what we have uh, still cause to uh, to plan for in terms of uncertainty. In terms of climate change adaptation, once we have this type of information, uh, it becomes uh, a new challenge to determine what types of solutions and what type of alternatives we might come up with. Um, in, in many ways, climate adaptation must be targeted to these specific climate hazards and tailored to the specifically affected system uh, to be most effective. Um, in this sense, we're also interested in adaptation timescales to understand whether the adaptation we're going for is something that would react to an ongoing crisis or to be proactive in terms of anticipating future concerns. Uh, both of these approaches have benefits and drawbacks. 
in terms of producing these adaptations, it's important to recognize the context of the current system and the people who are making decisions and affected by the current systems. For example, uh, it's important to recognize that there is already existing infrastructure, investments, and connection between the uh, impacted system and others. Um, it's important to recognize that decision makers often have multiple and sometimes competing motivations uh, beyond just the climate sphere. And uh, adaptations can benefit from integration into natural cycles of investment, uh, updates and maintenance of equipment uh, in terms of recognizing when action can, can uh, most efficiently be taken. Adaptation is also uh, a continuing process that is bolstered by solid scientific information. It is not, not a one at a time, one and done uh, action. It's usually something that has to be revisited as more climate information comes along and as uh, impacts and uh, systems change over time. As we're thinking about adaptation, it's important to recognize that adaptation actions uh, that are targeted to a specific climate hazard will have a clearer benefit than those that are taken in general to improve the performance of a system. Uh, this schematic is drawn from a paper by David Lobel uh, and looks at crop yields uh, in response to some kind of stress. Uh, so just for simplicity, let's take heat stress, uh, meaning this is warmer temperatures on the right and cooler temperatures uh, on the left. In the initial climate in the present day, we might be at, at location B. So we have a current crop system. And as temperature goes up, that cross, crop system is due to decline in yield. However, we might take some action to increase the overall levels of yield by modifying the system. So for example, this might be higher nitrogen levels for more fertilizer. That increases the yield. However, you'll see that as we go into a future climate situation, there is a corresponding loss of yield uh, that results in this increase in fertilizer having the same effect in, in today's climate as it does in the future, which suggests that the fertilizer is a benefit for the agricultural sector that does not really directly respond to the climate challenge. In contrast, we may have a situation on the right uh, where we have the same current system at this location B in the current climate, and here now, maybe we modify the system to plant at a different growing season uh, start date, so an earlier planting date, for example. This may have a small benefit today, but as the temperatures increase, this has a larger and larger benefit as uh, that climate uh, change occurs. This would be a good example of an adaptation in the sense that the, the action taken directly responds to the climate threat uh, and results in a larger benefit in those changing climate conditions. We can use the same approach in our global crop models to understand the benefit of specific adaptation types. Here again, looking at the crop models uh, that were organized by AGMET. The pixels that you see on the screen represent the benefit of selecting a alternative seed variety that is more in tune with the future climate conditions, especially the average temperature as climate change occurs. Where you see deeper greens are places where that reselection of a new seed variety has stronger benefit um, under that future climate condition. This helps us identify those places that have uh, the most acute need and also where the benefit may be the greatest for some kind of adaptation like this. Another example of, uh, of adaptation work uh, is around the idea of creating a space for adaptation actions. And here we'll, we'll spend a couple slides to look at uh, a case study, which is the New York Panel on Climate Change. Um, the, the NASA scientists at, at NASA GIS uh, facilitated a consortium of New York City agencies and private corporations, as well as academic leaders from the tri-state area. Uh, to convene and discuss climate information and prepare the city for climate impacts. Here is a, a slide, uh, a photo showing uh, one of the NASA guest scientists, Cynthia Rosenzweig, along with New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg back in February 2009. Um, this, this activity was, was promoted at a very high level within the city, uh, which allowed these discussions to get deep into operations and vulnerability planning. 
One of the things that this New York panel on climate change recognized was that the New York City uh, coastlines were uh, particularly important places when it comes to things like water treatment plants. Um, these water treatment facilities are not evenly spread out throughout the city, but are located especially on the banks of the rivers and along the coastlines. Uh, this means that these water treatment plants are particularly exposed to coastal flooding and storm surges, uh, such as those that might be exacerbated by sea level rise from climate change or by tropical cyclones and hurricanes that could hit New York City. Uh, this work identified a challenge of water treatment facilities uh, as a particularly uh, vulnerable and, and risky part of climate change, um, especially when we saw that there had already been events where there were flooding uh, along uh, water treatment plants at the coast, for example, uh, this photo of a, of a uh, backed up water treatment plant in the Bronx. Uh, when we identified this as a challenge, uh, that motivated the mayor and his agencies to lift um, water treatment plants uh, and, 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 and install pumps at higher elevations so that the coastline was better prepared uh, for the potential of a major hurricane that could, uh, could have coastal flooding in New York City. Of course, this was done back in 2009, uh, and a couple years later, Hurricane Sandy made its way towards New York City. Um, Hurricane Sandy also uh, was identified as the type, or as, as a, uh, an example of the type of event that could lead to problems in hurricane flooding for subway systems. Um, and here on the, on the left, you'll see a map of the subway tunnels that flooded when Hurricane Sandy came through. Uh, this was another thing discussed within this report. Um, and as you can imagine, this led uh, when Hurricane Sandy did come in to, to massive subway flooding um, and, and other uh, big problems in the area. So this, this example of, uh, of NASA scientists working with public, private, and academic partners to identify the types of challenges that could happen uh, under climate change situations and interacting with extreme events uh, helped New York City prepare for Hurricane Sandy. Um, we had a chapter also on transportation, for example, that looked at subway challenges. Um, this also meant that when uh, recovery funds came to New York City to, to build back a more resilient uh, coastline, uh, the, the New York Panel on Climate Change had the climate information that was uh, facilitating that type of planning effort. Uh, and, and that report was ready to go um, and, and right in the aftermath of, of that devastating storm. So to summarize, uh, climate information products can support mitigation, adaptation, and risk planning within strong scientific frameworks. NASA products support improved understanding of the climate system. Uh, climate applications also require selection of fit-for-purpose models and data sets. And the impacts and risk from climate affect many aspects of nature and society. If we look at historical climate and future climate projections and sectoral conditions, um, that can help drive planning uh, and make more scientifically robust um, strategies for the future. Climate decisions, of course, are facilitated especially by tailored climate information that recognizes the system vulnerabilities exposure, and local context of decision makers. Uh, and we, we do want to uh, thank also the uh, NASA Climate Adaptation Science Investigator Work Group, CASI, um, which is preparing climate adaptation and risk plans for NASA facilities, and also helped uh, in this effort to build climate literacy across NASA and, and the audience. Um, and we are really uh, thankful for your attention today. Um, if there are questions now, we would appreciate it if you could enter your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will answer them in the order they were received, and then we will post this Q&A to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Also for information, if you would like to have further discussion with uh, myself or Dan Bader, you can find our information here. Um, and there's more information on the training webpage for RSET um, and uh, the broader RSET website here. Thank you very much. And uh, we have one more uh, slide here just showing some of the uh, key resources 
that you might consider looking into um, as uh, you pursue kind of an information for your own applications. Thank you so much. Great, thanks everybody for sending in so many terrific questions. Uh, we've been uh, trying to answer them as they come in. Uh, we do have both uh, uh, Dan Bader as well as Alex Rain here to, to answer any of the questions that have been coming in. So do keep them coming and we appreciate it. So question number one, the resolution of climate models is improved thanks to higher resolution satellites or thanks to higher calculation power. Uh, Alex? All right, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the answer is, of course, both. Uh, we, we have uh, benefited in, in multiple ways from uh, having the improved observational uh, systems that we, that we have in terms of satellites and, and ground-based networks and, and uh, airplanes and everything that, that we put out there. Um, that gives us a better understanding of the fine-scale features of the climate system. Uh, which means we can improve our physics and the overall representation of these processes and the models. Um, of course, that improved understanding wouldn't be uh, possible to actually simulate unless we had these higher performance computers. So uh, with better physics and with better computers, we're able to put those two things together and have better simulations. Um, and we know that there's higher potential to go uh, even further, for example, as computational systems improve. Uh, there are uh, more things we'd like to get into our models, and we're working on that every day. Great. And this uh, question number two has to deal with more a regional analysis. So the uh, question is, how can I assess the effect of climate change in a specific region on a local scale using Earth observations? And for how long of a period should the analysis be carried out? So uh, the first part of this RSET training uh, went through a, a large uh, list of the resources within NASA and NASA's partners um, that could be useful in, in uh, this type of application. So uh, there are observational products related to specific aspects of the climate system that you may be interested in, like temperature or rainfall, ocean salinity, snow, ice, fire, and, and others. Um, so you can take those products to, to characterize the, the current climate system. Um, and we would recommend that you, uh, you find at least 20 years of data to capture robust statistics, um, whether you're looking at long-term trends and average conditions or some kind of distributional change, uh, for example, a shift towards more extreme events. Uh, I noted in the, the, uh, the text on the screen that, of course, climate phenomena can occur on very fast or slow timescales, you know, something like a tornado. Uh, is a, a strong weather event, but the statistics of how frequently tornadoes occur and where they occur and what season they occur is something that we might study with a, a climate uh, approach. So um, we need a, a large number of years to capture those statistics. Um, and if you're interested in something like a uh, rare extreme event, like a one in 100 year flood or a uh, you know extreme uh, heat wave, uh, you may need even longer uh, to understand what's going on there. So for example, at NASA GIS, we have uh, researchers looking into mega droughts and, uh, and long-term drought conditions. Um, those need longer times uh, because of the, the scale of those conditions as well. Great, thanks, Alex. And question number three, uh, what is the ideal climate modeling for maritime countries such as Indonesia compared to a landmass such as, say, the United States or Australia? So. Uh, Indonesia is a great example of a place with a large amount of uh, ocean land contrast and high mountains, and uh, it's it's a place where uh, you, uh, applications are often drawn to regional climate models so that they can capture those complex land sea circulations and and the influence of mountains and coastlines uh, and and diverse land covers. Um, of course, regional models are also useful over those big continents like the like North America or Australia. Um, for example, mountains in the Rockies or uh, or uh, you know complex coastlines in South Australia, things like that. Um, so, in general, uh, you know, regional models add important local detail, uh, but are still driven by the large scale patterns from the global climate models. So, uh, there's a question I think we'll get to in a minute that will go further on this. Uh, but in general, you have to be asking whether the benefit of that regional model uh, outweighs the potential kind of loss of, of uh, quality 
you know, as you're you're putting more and more models together, uh, you can sometimes uh, lose that signal as well. So finer resolution is not always a better signal and and more useful information, um, but it is something that that is uh, important. Uh, to ask whether you know the the phenomena you're after, the the decision that you're making is likely to be influenced by those fine scale features, uh, and in a place like Indonesia, uh, oftentimes it is. Yeah, and Alex, to follow up on that, this next question also kind of follows up on that that uh, uh, issue of, of of resolution. So, how does one downscale climate models, and what is the highest resolution that can be attained? So, uh, so here we've written out an example. Um, with with some generic numbers here of course uh when when people do this they they are much more specific on this uh but if we take a climate model that's run on a global level uh for example at 100 kilometer resolution or you know around one degree resolution we might use that climate model output as a boundary condition to drive a subsequent regional model maybe at 30 kilometer resolution and you can keep this process going you could then embed another model that has a 10 kilometer resolution uh, and you can keep going all the way down uh, to your finest resolution atmospheric model if, if, uh, if you so chose. Um, there are atmospheric models that are used uh, within city blocks, for example, to look at wind circulations, you know, coming around uh, uh, skyscrapers and, and block by block, you know, things. So you can get down to very, very fine resolution um, if, you, if you wanted to. Uh, but there is this degradation of the signal with each model um, just because of, of uh, you know, the effects of, of translating from a boundary into a finer, uh, finer grid and, and other things that, you know, the physics, um, you know, have to carry through. So uh, just because we can scale down to very fine resolutions doesn't mean that it's always the most useful thing to do, um, especially if you have limited resources for uh, computation and, uh, and analysis. Uh, or the observations that would validate those models. Um, so we recommend choosing your resolution depending on the application you have in mind and the likelihood that some fine resolution process or geography will have an influence. Um, if, and uh, a major challenge, uh, just, just to, to say that this, this uh, process going from coarse resolution down to fine resolution is not always a smooth and linear one there are times where there are fundamental changes in the way we approach the, the meteorology or the climate uh, processes. Uh, and one of those I'll just mention, which is that when you get below about eight kilometer resolution, the model starts to need uh, you know, actual uh, physics around convection in the atmosphere. Things like thunderstorms uh, have a, uh, you know, be, start to be directly resolved and, and therefore you introduce a whole other set of physical packages um, which can be very interesting, but also, you know, have their own sets of biases that have to be understood. So there are these kind of steps and, uh, and bottlenecks, you know, in terms of as we're, as we're downscaling that we have to keep in mind. Thank you, Alex. Question number five, which climate models do you use? Are they open source? Also, which programming languages are they developed in? So, uh, the, I, maybe I should answer this myself. So the climate model that I use is the NASA GIS Model E because that's where I, I sit at NASA GIS. But in most of our applications, uh, we are using an ensemble of, of climate models that come from the Sixth Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP-6, uh, which was mentioned in the presentation. Um, CMIP-6 has around 100 models from about 50 different modeling groups. Um, the models are all documented in peer-reviewed publications. Uh, and many are open source and freely available, including uh, Model E. The models tend to be uh, developed in a, in a variety of languages, but most often um, I've seen models using Fortran due to its computational efficiency. Um, and uh, uh, these models have been, uh, been uh, made available and, and used, of course, not just at the modeling centers, but in a, a, a network usually of, of model users across uh, public and private and academic institutions, um, and usually those models benefit from from all of those those uh, you know different user groups that that contribute uh, and you know in terms of code development and validation. Okay, question number six. What does the zero indicate in slide twenty four? All right, so slide twenty four was looking at those climate stripes. 
And when we went out into the future uh, pathways, there were a couple uh, lines on there. So this, this question is looking at a zero line in slide 24. Um, and that zero line was actually an indication of the net zero carbon emissions date. Uh, so each of these uh, emissions uh, scenarios, each of these SSP RCPs, um, have uh, emissions going out towards the end of the century. And in some of the low emission scenarios, uh, not only do, do human uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduce dramatically, in some cases they reach net zero or even net negative emissions, meaning humans are pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere than they are putting into the atmosphere. Uh, so that that time is is noted on that chart as that zero line, when net zero occurs. Great, I hope whoever asked that question, I hope that that, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, the next next question, question seven, has to do with marine ecosystems. So are corals a net contributor to atmospheric carbon dioxide or do they help in sequestration? So here I would love to have a, a marine biologist to, uh, to double check all this for me, but my understanding is, is that corals um, use carbon in their skeletons. Um, and therefore can help sequester carbon from the climate system. And, and we see that in, in limestones and other things like that, uh, where, where those, uh, you know, the, the accumulation of, of uh, coral skeletons, um, you know, can, can pull uh, and, and sequester carbon into the rocks. Okay, question number eight. Which is the scenario that seems to be the one we follow according to the decisions that are already implemented? Uh, is it RCP uh, 1.5 or RCP 8.5? So this is a, a complicated question. I'm, I'm going to give it a, a, a quick answer here. Um, but the, the, the larger issue of pathways is one that I think you'll see in the next several questions. Um, so I'll preface it that way. Um, most of the scenarios uh, and the pathways that we simulate are quite similar uh, in the current and, and, uh, and near term years. Um, because they all start at the same starting point early in the 21st century, uh, depending on which simulations that could be 20, uh, 2005 or 2015, um, the emissions have, have been among the higher pathways in recent years, but it's not a one-to-one -one following any given RCP. Um, and the pathways really are more intriguing and interesting when we look farther out into the future. Uh, so 10 years out into the future, you can see differences, and especially 30 years out into the future, they really start to diverge. Um, so I, I would just caution about uh, using the last several years as a predictive way of which pathway we're on, because the, the bottom line of each of these pathways is that the decisions we're making now continue to determine which one we will follow. Um, I will note that uh, the RCP 8.5 pathway um, includes assumptions about coal use, which no longer seem to be um, as as practical or as uh, as realistic as as uh, they they once were. Um, so that that uh, overall reduction in coal use that we have seen in the world uh, suggests that RCP 8.5 is useful as a, a high emission scenario and uh, and as a uh, uh, pathway of, of high global warming levels. Um, but in, in many cases, I'm seeing increasingly RCP 7.0 used as a high emissions pathway. Um, and RCP 8.5 still tells us a lot about the, the response of the, of the climate system um, and, uh, and, and how, how it would work at different global warming levels. But the exact timing of some of those things you see in RCP 8.5, uh, people are increasingly questioning. Um, so so uh, RCP 7.0 is definitely one you should consider. All right, thanks again, Alex. And the next one, very specific to the country of Mexico. Uh, currently, there are a number of a uh, series of scenarios that have been generated around the world. In your case, which is the best scenario for Mexico? Um, so here, I, I can't it can't claim to be a, an expert on Mexican scenarios. Uh, what I will say is that uh, whenever we're we're looking at uh, a, a specific region. Uh, it's important to recognize that there are a variety of climate models and a variety of scenarios. The first thing I would say is that you should be looking at multiple climate models and multiple SSP RCP scenarios so that you can understand the climate and pathway uncertainties. Um, uh, there are downscaled scenarios that include Mexico, for example, uh, NARCAP, which is the uh, North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program, I believe. 
uh, and Cortex, the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment. Uh, those may have scenarios that you would be interested in uh, for Mexico, although at some of those domains, they, they, uh, they cut Mexico into northern and southern parts. So there's, there may be uh, a need to, to link those together. Um, the other thing that you might want to look at would be the NASA Earth Exchange bias adjusted scenarios. Uh, those would be at relatively high resolution and have a consistent methodology uh, across Mexico. Um, so check those out and make sure you don't just take one uh, climate model, but you look at, at the, uh, the potential of uh, multiple climate models giving an indication of uncertainty. Great. Question number 10. How can I assess the effects of climate change on a specific region on a local scale using Earth observations? And for how long should the analysis be carried out? So this is similar to the earlier question, um, but what we'll say is that the, one of the first things you want to do in, in climate change analysis is assess the, or, and characterize the current climate. Uh, here you can use weather stations and remote sensing products. Uh, but find the ones that target and capture the key aspects of climate that affect the things you care about. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, in cities uh, flooding, you might want to look at, at heavy rainfall events um, and check that against your stormwater drainage systems, for example. Um, and for that, we have precipitation products that, that focus on heavy rainfall. Uh, and we have others that are better for drought and others that are focused on uh, temperature and therefore might be useful for extreme heat. Um, so characterizing the average conditions, but also the, the distribution of extreme events uh, is what I would recommend. Um, then the climate models come along and tell us how the climate changes. Uh, so we might see shifts in the trends of average conditions or the distribution of extreme events. Um, and we can potentially use bias adjustment or downscaling to, to connect those climate model projections into the observational systems. Uh, and get something closer to uh, to the, the conditions observed on the ground. Um, so that will help us reach the scales of decision making. So in terms of time periods, we would recommend uh, at least 20 years to capture the climate signals and not get, uh, get lost in the internal variability. Um, and if you are looking at rare events or long-term droughts, you may need longer term periods uh, to capture that, that, uh, that set of changes. Okay, question 11. Given that climate change is mostly attributed to human activities, how is natural climate change differentiated from anthropogenic sources? All right, so we, um, we can use our climate models to see the signature of different types of, of climate changes on the climate system. Um, and we can draw those out using our climate models, for example, by setting them up to only include certain forcers. So for example, we can set up our climate models with only natural forcers, uh, things like shifts in the sun's output uh, or volcanoes. And then we can compare those against simulations that also include human influences like land use change or greenhouse gas emissions. And we had a slide uh, that showed the difference between those two and, and underscored the importance of the human influences in terms of capturing recently observed events. Uh, we also can use those to disentangle specific types of influences in recent decades. And then because we understand that, we can understand how shifts in greenhouse gas emissions will, uh, will influence climate in the decades ahead. Okay, question number 12. How are policies included in the models? So policies are included in the models through these driving socioeconomic pathways. Um, the SSP RCP scenarios include things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions policies, land use uh, protections, uh, the ability, the uh, investments in things like technological growth or the sharing of adaptation uh, technologies across different countries. Um, these policies are therefore represented in the driving conditions in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, or land use that that affects that climate system. Um, we use these representative policy scenarios, the, these SSP RCPs that, that we've discussed here, um, as the kind of fundamental set, but we do have many simulations that are developed to explore specific policy options and their ramifications for the climate system. So we did show, for example, uh, that 
exploration of uh, of electric vehicles, um, you know, mandates and and policies um, to see, uh, you know, what that would mean for for the climate system. And question number thirteen: Do you know a website that displays paleoclimate changes throughout the Cenozoic or the Pleistocene? So this one, I didn't have a quick answer for you. I think we would have to uh, circle back on that uh, and check with our paleoclimate experts. Um, I, I don't have a website off the top of my head. Um, so let's see if we can find a better answer to that uh, with, with some more time. Okay, and question 14. Is the one and a half degree ceiling, uh, as indicated by the Paris Agreement, sufficient to check the spate of increasing frequency of climate-related disasters currently experienced across the world? So the recent IPCC report uh, showed that human influence is already changing the climate in, in every region of the world. Uh, and these changes include shifts toward more extreme events. Um, we also saw a, as a fundamental conclusion that the, the changes in these climatic impact drivers uh, will be more pronounced and more widespread with each increment of climate change. Uh, which also means with you know every bit of greenhouse gas emissions, the the world is currently about one 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial conditions uh, defined as the the late 19th century. Um, so if if the question is whether the 1.5 degree target would be enough to uh, to stop what we're seeing today, the answer is actually 1.5 degrees would be more than what we see today. Um, but would prevent the even stronger uh, changes that would happen above that level. Um, when it comes to the climate system, 1.5 degrees uh, is is not a a big tipping point as much as it it is a, uh, a you know one one stop along this this uh, path that brings us to to larger and larger changes. Um, so it is it is a useful policy. Uh, uh, marker but from the climate system you know we we see the changes happening all the way up to 1.5 and continuing to happen after that okay question 15 as noted in the presentation sub 100 kilometer information from climate models is not reliable at the moment what could be the best approach to integrate local data with available climate models so the, what, what I hope to say in the presentation is that if you have a model that is at a 100 kilometer resolution, you're not going to get information below 100 kilometers. So you would have to use some kind of downscaling uh, approach. That would include things like dynamical downscaling, where you reg use a regional climate model, um, or empirical approaches, where you use the large scale climate information from a climate model to predict smaller scale. For example, if you knew that a, a low pressure system sitting off the coast of Boston was likely to, to lead to a, a nor'easter, uh, you might get that information from a course model, but then extend it to that, that finer uh, extreme event. Um, we also use bias adjustment, um, which is a way of, of saying that we have local information that is, uh, is uh, indicative of the likely patterns of conditions and maybe even changes uh, at a finer resolution than the, the global model is giving us. So bias adjustment, yeah, allows us to connect local patterns um, into uh, the, the climate, you know, model projections um, and, uh, and, and gives us uh, a way of, of connecting observations and, and climate changes from the models. Thanks, Alex. And question 16, what do you mean by the heat hotspots in New York City presented in slide 40, and how did you identify it? Is it the same as urban heat islands? Can we consider the urban heat islands a form of climate change? Uh, on this one, I believe Dan Bader may be best equipped to uh, respond. Dan, can you get this one? Yeah, okay, I can unmute myself, sorry about that. Um, so on slide 40, what you're seeing is areas within New York City that have been identified as hotspots. And that identification can often take place with remote sec sensing or satellite technologies. Those are just warm areas within the city itself. The urban heat island refers to the phenomena that urban areas, cities are warmer than 
their surrounding more rural areas. So New York City relative to the suburbs and more rural regions outside of the city does have the urban heat island effect. Uh, surface temperatures are elevated and in some cases it's up to five or six degrees Fahrenheit um, peak of the summer, let's say. Within the city itself, there are cooler spots, parks, more vegetated areas, and warmer areas, uh, central business district areas with um, darker colored surfaces. Um, so that's really the distinction between uh, the two here. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dan. And we're going to go to question 17. I'm interested to know the sea temperature at a certain depth and bottom in the past and future. Any advice on where to find the climate data I should use and the equation I should use to do the analysis would be much appreciated. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, I think this is another one where it, it's worth us uh, doing a little bit of follow through to give you uh, more specific information about uh, where you can find those data. But I will mention that there is a, a major program uh, called Argo. Um, which is a, uh, a set of autonomous uh, buoys. So these are, uh, are floating uh, instruments that uh, have an ingenious uh, system that allows them to float around with the currents and occasionally dive down into, uh, into the water column uh, and float at a different depth. Uh, and then uh, once again, dive even deeper. And each time it does this, it then comes back up to the, the surface and, uh, and transmits its, its data findings. Um, but this gives us uh, information about currents. It also gives us information about the, uh, the, the temperature and salinity profile of, of the ocean um, and has really revolutionized our understanding of what is happening within the depths of the ocean. Uh, so the Argo floats are definitely a, a data set you should check out. Um, in terms of the future projections, a lot of these climate models include, uh, you know, a three or pretty much all of them include uh, three dimensional oceans uh, that have projections of uh, shifts in overall heat capacity and, and uh, energy in the oceans, but also changes in uh, ocean structure and currents. Um, so you would find that information within the CMIP 6 models. And I see the person typing on the screen. Yeah, just please note that uh, the, all of these data sets, you could say all of these CMIP-6 climate models uh, include 3D information as well. Great, question 18. Uh, land use and land change classification for relatively large areas incurs errors. Uh, for example, if compared with relatively small areas, for example, a city. How can we get the same result for both small and large areas? Please mention models, algorithms, et cetera. Thanks. Yeah, so this is a, a, a much deeper conversation, um, but what I can say here is that um, when we are looking in a region with, with complex and heterogeneous um, uh, land use, this could be a, re a region where a regional model makes sense uh, to use. Uh, sometimes we can get much more uh, accurate information in different land covers uh, and land uses uh, with those regional models. Now that said, when we when we scale up to a, a larger area, um, we are often trying to represent the, uh, the the net effect of all of those land uses and land covers within a larger grid cell, um, and that is done uh, through the use of of uh, land cover and, and land use data sets that. Uh, that are designed to aggregate that type of information into, into useful quantities. Um, so it, the, the way that we can do that, um, also within our climate models, we often have what are called tiles within uh, each grid cell that represents, for example, open ocean or open water versus uh, forests versus grasslands or agricultural areas. Um, or, or urban built up zones. Um, and we can represent the different water and energy balances within those tiles as a subcomponent, uh, which then aggregates up to the total. 
Um, so there are models that do this to a greater or lesser extent, uh, but we do represent different land use and land cover types within the grid cells as we're doing our, our, uh, our water and energy and carbon balances for each grid cell. And question 19, how is a global climate model differentiated from a regional climate model? So the answer here is twofold. The first and, and foremost is that the regional climate model is going to operate at a finer resolution um, than uh, the global model. Uh, now, the regional climate model uh, will often, therefore, contain uh, more complex, uh, higher resolution dynamics. Um, and in that sense, may capture thunderstorms in a way that the global model wouldn't have, or, or tropical cyclones, um, just as some examples. Uh, now, that said, the global model is often more uh, of, an, of an Earth system model, uh, for example, having uh, more direct representations of the uh, ocean depths and the cryosphere and the biosphere uh, and the forcing information, for example, uh, from from uh, different uh, natural forces. So uh, so each of those have have a role, but the regional models require global models uh, to drive their boundaries. Um, so once again, just to summarize, I see people typing on the screen. Um, regional models are at finer resolution. They have some more complex dynamics, uh, but also uh, lack some of the Earth system components that that make the global models more comprehensive. Question 20. As climate changes become increasingly more severe and more prevalent, I imagine many sectors such as public health, international development, etc., will have to adapt to take climate factors into consideration more so than they currently are. What fields of work slash study do you think will begin to emerge to address the climate crisis? So, uh, so there's some good notes on the screen here about how the, the uh, IPCC uh, has a working group too, which focuses on vulnerability impacts and adaptation. And they break down their, uh, their impacts into multiple sectors, uh, including terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, ocean and coastal ecosystems, water resources, food, cities, infrastructure, health, and various uh, forms of poverty and sustainable development and livelihoods. So each of these sectors, uh, there is a tremendous amount of work going on in terms of understanding the vulnerabilities, the hazards, the exposure, and therefore the comprehensive risk posed by climate change. Um, we also recognize that there are systemic effects and unforeseen impacts that can come from extreme weather and climate events. Um, so there are, there are still emerging areas of study. Um, I would say that, uh, Thinking more broadly, there is uh, increasing uh, fields of study around assessing vulnerability. Um, what you see from the climate models is, you know, an indication, for example, that there will be more heat waves. Um, but the work you just saw about New York City, for example, is an effort to understand who will be most vulnerable to those heat waves. Um, I think that's a, a growing field of study that, that could be done in any sector. Um, I also think uh, recognizing that adaptations uh, are designed to reduce vulnerability or to uh, limit the exposure to extreme events, for example, uh, by, by re reducing the amount of uh, you know, uh, critical infrastructure in a floodplain. Um, those, those can be better connected and, and there's a lot of work in terms of understanding adaptations and technologies that would enable that. And then maybe the final area of study that I think is a growth area is in the contextual implementation of adaptation and other resilience and, uh, and risk management strategies. Um, so understanding that, uh, that adaptation changes have to be in the uh, context of uh, broader social and economic programs and policies um, and figuring out uh, how that can be done in a way that, that minimizes disruption but maximizes resilience and, and uh, sustainability. Great. And question 21, 
why is it necessary for the uh, coupled modeled uh, in intercomparison project known as CMIP to add an even lower radiative force scenario such as RCP 1.9? I was working with CMIP 5. RCP 2.6 was the lowest, and the research I checked out mostly focused on RCP 4.5 and 8.5, ignoring the 2.61 because it is less probable to happen. So why should an even lower RCP 1.9 be considered? So the, the thing that's important to recognize about these scenarios and pathways is that they are illustrative of the decisions that, that could be made. Um, RCP 1.9 is, is an extreme mitigation scenario. There is uh, very strong emissions reductions and net zero uh, uh, carbon comes very quickly and then negative emissions uh, beyond that. Uh, it's important to recognize this as an option uh, because um, there are decisions that, that could be made to push us towards this 1.9 degree world. Um, and those decisions have costs and have benefits. Uh, so by including this pathway, we can weigh the costs and the benefits of, of strong mitigation efforts um, and, uh, and, and show uh, you know, what it would take to, to create um, a, a uh, high mitigation world uh, along these lines. Um, so what, what this comes down to, in, in my opinion, is not a, it's not that we are predicting this pathway, we are showing what it would take should a policymaker ask how, how could we achieve a very low global warming level. Um, and in, in that sense, uh, this, this pathway is quite useful to understand uh, the, the complex uh, kind of implementation challenges around those mitigations. Um, but also shows us that some of the, uh, the, the uh, long-term effects, even of a high mitigation scenario, for example, on oceans, can still be uh, substantial when it comes to things like sea level rise. Um, so I think the, the note taker is doing a great job of capturing some of the things I'm trying to say. Um, it's, yeah, it's understanding uh, the, 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 uh, the trade-offs involved in reaching uh, this this uh, low, uh, kind of high high mitigation low emissions future. Okay, question number twenty two. Within the modeling of scenarios that have been crossed with vegetation layers, this gives us which types of vegetation which would benefit and others would be at risk. And could these be the cause of fires and pests among other things? Uh, thanks for the question. So, so this uh, this is a question I'm going to to uh, respond by saying that to me this motivates uh, interest and in, and potentially our set producing further uh, trainings related to specific types of climate impacts. What we were able to present today was the framework by which we we uh, you know approach uh, impact assessment. This question is really asking about the types of, of vegetation impacts and the, the competitive uh, you know, balance between different species in an ecosystem. These are important and fascinating questions. Unfortunately, we, we really didn't cover that today other than to indicate the types of climate information and the approaches that, that you might use to, to answer those questions. Um, I'll just note that, that this is an important topic uh, because as we noted, there are more than one type of climate change happening at the same time. Uh, and these things can interact not only in the climate system, but also can, uh, can interact within the affected system itself. So for example, if, if we have uh, an increase in drought conditions that might favor certain types of plants um, and change the overall uh, the overall kind of uh, array of, of plants in an ecosystem and, and the balance of that ecosystem, which in turn can, can change the vulnerability to fire weather and the fires that may result. Uh, these things are, are, are being observed all over the world um, and the models might give us some foresight and some insight into what, what might be coming. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you, Alex. And, and to, to follow up on what you were just referring to, uh, 
we did have a, a series of poll questions in the first part of this webinar series, and there will be a survey sent to you, to everybody uh, that participated in, in today's training, and as well as last week's, um, to, to gauge your interest on what future climate topics that RCIT should be focused on. And we take those very seriously. And so for all of you that are part of this call today and, and joined last week as well, uh, please do fill out the surveys because uh, they really guide on, on, on what future topics that, were, that there's most interest in from the community. So uh, we do encourage you, uh, building off what Alex was just referring to, to please fill out that survey and, and we will uh, base our future trainings focused on climate around uh, your uh, preferences. So do look for that in the coming week. So question, 20, uh, question 23, does modeling using grids, the impacts of climate change in any way counter the biases from climate models? Um, so I'm not sure I'm following the, the GPS acronym here, um, but I think um, what maybe I'm getting at here is, is if there is a, if bias adjustment really can counter the biases from, from climate models. Um, so, so I'll at least answer that question. Uh, and, and hope uh, the, the questioner will forgive me if I if I've misinterpreted um, the yeah bias adjustment is is an important aspect um, recognizing that climate models tend to have slight uh, deviations in terms of the uh, average temperature or the, the seasonal pro progression of rainfall these are things that are improving with each model iteration um, but there will always be a, uh, a a gap between what the model does and the best observational systems. Um, and that is something that we can reduce using bias adjustment, but it is important to recognize that the bias adjustment itself has statistical assumptions. Uh, for example, in terms of which variables and which distributions are adjusted. For example, if you are adjusting only the seasonal average temperatures, um, you will you will likely miss some of the extreme event characteristics uh, that that could happen within that. Or maybe a better way of saying it would be if you are only adjusting the average amount of rainfall when it does occur, you will not capture changes in the number of rainy days. Um, those types of assumptions in the bias adjustment must be uh, understood to uh, to to read into or to to draw conclusions. Uh, from the resulting changes. Uh, so there are huge benefits to bias adjustment without a doubt, uh, especially when you factor in mountains and coastlines. Uh, and uh, a, a simple example would be a, a single 100 kilometer grid cell uh, over a place like Greece uh, will include high mountains and valleys. And if you are growing agricultural commodities in those valleys, your average temperature will be biased by those high mountain peaks uh, and you will not have a good representation of those valley temperatures unless you have some form of bias adjustment. Uh, those types of, of uh, effects can, can, uh, can change all kinds of things, whether it's agriculture or ecosystems uh, or water resources. Okay, moving on, question 24. Do you have examples and or case studies about the situation in different Latin American and Caribbean countries? Uh, in this case, they're trying to uh, look at biomass, for example, sugarcane policy uh, in Brazil and its impact on agriculture and within the Amazon. Uh, so this is a, 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 I'll answer this question in two ways. The first is from a climate standpoint, uh, the Caribbean is, a, is an area with lots of small scale features that is not very well captured by global models, uh, so so the specific uh, climatic zones on Caribbean islands would be better captured by regional models. Um, however, some of the broader patterns of, uh, for example, drought and aridity in the Caribbean uh, can be captured even by global models. Um, now, the the larger question about uh, agricultural commodities and and uh, bioenergy crops like biomass are like uh, sugarcane. Um, is again, you know, something that that I would love to talk to you uh, from an agricultural impacts perspective. Uh, it, it was not something we presented on today, but there are projections, for example, in that AgMIP project that I've mentioned, uh, that look at uh, sugarcane over uh, Brazil and uh, and and comparing it against changes in in soy and and maize in the region. Um, 
and there are uh, interesting questions related to policies and large scale market systems in agriculture, uh, which, which we can explore using not only crop models, but uh, agricultural market models. Uh, so so I'll, I'll take this moment to plug one of my own projects, which is this AgMIP uh, project. If you check out agmip.org, um, that would be a place you might find some connections that are interested in this area. And question 25, what are some current efforts to get more precise localized data? Uh, there are there are many. Um, I, I will say that that this includes uh, groups who are setting up uh, local uh, instrumentation. For example, in New York City, we are trying to put more instruments on uh, roofs and throughout the city so we can understand some of these fine scale features uh, that are that are affecting uh, the city. Um, there are also improved satellite products uh, that are that are getting to higher resolution. There are also many uh, uh, new uh, satellite systems offering finer resolution information uh, via NASA and and partners in the private sector even. Um, and this type of information is is uh, is increasing the overall amount of observations and uh, the resolutions of these. Um, and I would just say that that uh, any of these new products uh, is important to to ground truth and uh, and having those those local instruments still will will be quite important. Um, and uh, and and having that that uh, local validation, whether it's in a field or or on a rooftop, uh, is is always going to be a fundamental part of the scientific process. Thank you, Alex. Question 26. Is there an interface or portal to incorporate environmental data sets into these broader modeling constructs? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, there are many efforts to do this. I'm not sure whether there is one single, um, but uh, certainly there are, are uh, you know, the, the bias adjustment community is looking for better data sets to bias adjust towards. Um, the the crop modeling community is looking for better information about what agricultural fields are out there and soil conditions uh, and when people are planting, for example. Um, and uh, some of the recent efforts to harmonize formats uh, of different data sets is proving to be very useful in terms of allowing different environmental data sets to communicate and connect to each other. Um, and the broader effort behind things like CMIP um, is to create uh, common data sets and formats so that we can harmonize the input conditions and make our models more directly comparable. Um, so uh, maybe just to say again, you know, by having common formats and available environmental data sets, we are better able to drive consistent ensembles of models um, for, our, uh, for our assessments. Great, and question 27. Since climate models are dependent on different initial conditions, boundary conditions, and ECS, what does this mean for the climate model users? So I would say that in, in, it's important for the climate model users, and hopefully today's uh, RSET training has given you an indication of why these things are important. But just to recognize that the modeling groups themselves um, are going to give slightly different projections of the future, depending on things like this equilibrium climate sensitivity, ECS. Um, and, uh, and that those projections will also depend on conditions like the emission scenarios um, that, that drive you know, effectively our, our boundary conditions coming in uh, driving the model. Um, the initial conditions are something that is uh, going to affect the first years and maybe decades of a projection, um, but become less and less important over the future decades uh, because the chaotic nature of, of the climate system and the broader climate changes start to, to dominate. Um, so recognizing that 
each of the initial conditions and the boundary conditions and the model uncertainties with ECS being just one of several components of what makes a model different. Um, each of these things affect the long-term projections you might see, and therefore it's important to recognize uh, you know, the use of multiple models and scenarios um, to understand the future. Great, question 28. As climate science is dynamic, how best is existing technology to serve people's adaptation and mitigation measures? Considering the worst case scenario, do we have a robust system to communicate such rapid changes with informed decision making? How about reaching that last mile, for example, poor nations uh, SIDS being facilitated in this regard? So here again, I, I would, uh... I want to appreciate the question and say it's a very important one. Um, it's not something that we've covered in this RSET training uh, at, at this point, although it would be a useful topic for, for future training. And the question, uh, I think, comes from exactly the right perspective, which is that, you know, once we have this information, uh, how can we implement it? How can we turn this into uh, actions? And this does require a implementation uh, framework or a set of experts and resources and other things that that uh, allow us to uh, to to create decision systems and and be both reactive and proactive um, so I've just put a bunch of things on the table here but the the bottom line is uh, taking this climate information to implementation uh, requires planning um, requires a recognition of uh, different populations having different needs um, and uh, and it requires uh, connecting uh, the climate information to the specific actions uh, that are under consideration uh, whether it's to uh, reduce vulnerability to a drought for an agricultural system uh, or provide some kind of flood protections for a, uh, a tropical cyclone Great, thank you so much. And let's see, question 29. The climate simulation models often rely on additional models like crop yield. This clearly indicates that the uncertainty thereby increases exponentially with minor errors in any of these models. How do the climate models mitigate these errors? So, um, so we noted in the presentation that the, the error can increase uh, with, with additional uh, links in this chain from climate information to to impact sectors um exponentially I, I i'm not sure i agree with that because there are there are different types of of uh, error propagation but the overall uh concept i think that the the question is is asking is is an important one um so what we do is we ask uh specific questions of each type of of model um, and we look at how that uncertainty cascades to figure out what important pieces of information are leading to those uncertainties. Um, so another way of saying that is if we look at a given action, for example, a, a crop model uh, that is testing a, a, a earlier planting date, um, if the, the broad variety of climate models and crop models that simulate that give us an uncertainty uh, that is so large that we cannot determine a, a course of action, then we might try to trace back and say, is it because of the rainfall or is it because of the crop representation of a certain process uh, or is it because of the pathway uncertainty in our, in our climate projection? Um, so we can either use that process to identify the key sources of uncertainty, which is useful, um, or we might find ourselves in a situation where despite that uncertainty, it is still clear that there would be a benefit to that action. So for example, if the probability of that adaptation being successful uh, is you know, 80%, regardless of the scenario that were provided, that might be enough information to motivate that action. Um, and in general, this becomes a longer engagement with stakeholders where we would ask, uh, to what level of confidence uh, would you need uh, to make an action? And how does that compare to the, the level of confidence that, that the climate impact assessment can provide? Um, and there are 
there are many cases where the the information from the model is enough uh, to take some action, recognizing that a lack of action is in its own way a decision as well. Um, so oftentimes what we are trying to do is provide more information and scientific backing or understanding as a foundation for the actions that are being taken. Well, Alex, thank you so much. We are at the top of the hour and to be respectful for your time and to Dan's time and as well as everybody that has joined us for this, this lengthy two hour webinar. Uh, before I wrap things up, I just wanted to hand it over to you if you had anything you wanted to say to the uh, participants. Um, I, I think for the most part, I'm, I'm uh, happy to see such, such interesting questions and I see that we still have uh, a large number of attendees uh, listening to these questions. Uh, so we will try to, to answer as many of them as we can and post the, the results uh, on, online uh, so you can see if your question was answered. Um, and in general, uh, please do get in touch if you have specific questions about what we've done. Uh, both the RSAT team and myself would be, be happy to, to receive some questions. And uh, in particular, please speak out if there is more that you would like to learn about uh, in terms of these RSAT trainings. And remember that this part one, part two climate training was meant as an introduction uh, and hopefully a, a foundation builder for, for uh, more detailed ARSA trainings to come. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Alex. And, uh, and just a reminder to everybody, there is a homework assignment. You can find it from the training website. Uh, do access that, that is live as we speak. So uh, if you wish to get a certificate for attending both parts of this training, as well as uh, you know, to, to get that certificate, please do go ahead and, and complete the homework assignment. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, this has been a, a really successful two-part training. Uh, very, very big thanks to Alex Ruane and Dan Bader from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Thank you so much for joining for both parts and contributing so much to this webinar series. I also want to thank everybody from the RSET team. That's Amita Mekta, uh, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, and Jonathan O'Brien. Uh, they've been in the background uh, working magic for all of you, uh, even though you might not have been able to see them. Thank you, uh, Selwyn, for transcribing all of the answers that they've been taking place live. Uh, we great, greatly appreciate everybody. And do uh, please do fill out the surveys that will be coming to you within the week, because they will help guide us in future training. So thank you for everybody for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you at our next training. Thank you.